Um, my name is Nicolas Merritt. And I'm a student in Indiana State University's Doctorate of Athletic Training Program, and I'm currently in a course where we're talking about underserved and emerging populations uh, in the United States. We had the opportunity to chat with a couple underserved um, areas within athletic training, and then we were encouraged to find uh, an individual outside of the United States to see what their experiences were like in athletic training um, and how they kind of differed from, from our own. Um, okay. So okay. would you be able to introduce yourself for anybody who may be watching and uh, for me and give me an idea of how you decided to, um, if you moved from the US or if you were currently been in um, uh, the country in Trinidad and Tobago outside of the US, um, how long you've been there and how long you've been practicing and what drove you to be an athletic trainer? Okay, so my name is Kemba Noel London. I um, am Trinidadian by birth and nationality and heritage. I was born and raised in Trinidad and Tobago. I left when I was 18 to go to St. Louis University um, to go to school. Initially, I was pre-med biochemistry because I was clearly crazy. Um, at the time, and um, and it mainly stemmed from the fact that I, I, my education system growing up was very much Commonwealth and British, and we call call stuff physio here, and in the states it was PT, and I didn't really realize that it it's the same but not really. So I kind of tried to get into the PT program, and then kind of stumbled upon athletic training, and then realized this was kind of what I was looking for, and not. American version of PT because I very much wanted to be the physio or sports doctor for Chelsea Football Club. Um, I was very obsessed with Frank Lampard and Chelsea at the time, so I really wanted to go <laughs> and work with Chelsea and I realized that athletic training was very much what I was seeing happening on the pitch or that, the British version of that anyway. Um, so yeah, so I ended up in athletic training program and St. Louis University was one of the first ones, one of the few ones that was entry level masters. So I got my masters in athletic training um, from SLU and then I did an internship at USC. And because I am an international student, I I, I feel like I should say this in a very nice way, but for all intents and purposes, I kind of got kicked out um, because um, which is no fault of, it's no fault of anybody else. It's just the immigration system combined with how athletic training hires and works. It's not um, international person friendly. Um, to is say it that because to of the visa and such? Yeah, so yeah. So because if you notice like the time that uh, they'll post jobs, it's probably like around June, around there, and then this, or like maybe May, sometimes, sometimes at the beginning of the year kind of thing, and the start date is August. If you are applying for a work visa, you're very, very rarely, unless you know somebody or very extenuated circumstances, your start date will never be August, it's always October. That's just how the visa system and immigration works. It does not make any sense. There is no firm ever in the face of the earth that wants to start October. That is the most random month in the world to start a contract. <laughs> but that's how it works, like it starts October. Like um, two or three months later than what would normally be a start date. Exactly, so for me, what was the issue is that I applied for lots of residents and I got through to the end and I was one of the people to be considered but they honestly had no idea what to do with me because <laughs> I had my internship was um, a year which we get after so when you get become an international student you if your program's four or five years your visa lasts for that long and then after that period you have something called OPT which is optional um, practical training which is basically you get a free, a free pass to work for a year in the US but once that time's up if you don't have a job you gotta go right because you can't stay you can't be legal that kind of thing so I my internship year at USC so my year working at USC was um, my OPT and I had like three months, three months after when my last date of working was to either find a job or to leave. Um, and I had been applying. So it's not that I wasn't proactive and applying for stuff, but it's again, because there aren't that many international athlete trainers or that I don't, I don't really know of, but I, I don't think that there, that, that there are that many 
true internationals working as athletic trainers in the US. Um, most employers have no clue what to do with us and no clue what how to go about the visa process. And the current visa process is daunting as hell. It's a lot of paperwork and a lot of money for no guarantees because you are not guaranteed to get a job because it's very much a Russian roulette. So it's very much a pick from a hat, whoever gets it, gets it, whoever doesn't get it, gets it. So um, it's it's a lot of investment for no guaranteed return. So it doesn't it doesn't really bode well for people who come to these states to learn athletic training um, and want to go back. Either once if you want to go back, then it's easier. But if you come to a country and you want to stay and work and learn and learn more and grow more and develop more just because you know athletic training is not a profession in the country where you come from. So you want to be able to go back with as much knowledge that you have, um, that you can have, um, but you don't really have that option. You kind of have to go when they tell you have to go <laughs> and kind of just figure out life from there. So that kind of skipped a few things. I got into athletic training because I used to be a national um, volleyballer. So I used to play national volleyball for Trinidad and Tobago. Oh, wow. Um, from the age of 13 until uh, I tore my ACL at 15, the day before I was supposed to make my first senior team cap. So as you can tell, it was a little bit traumatizing because I still remember no. the day and time. No, <laughs> the so yeah, and the management of that after, even then at that age, I knew that, that the way that it was handled wasn't right. They basically, I told my ACL at practice and I live on an island. So practice was on the northern eastern end of the island and I live on the southwestern side of the island. So that's easily, um, and at the time I was 15, so I was traveling. I used public transportation, I didn't have a car. Um, so what they did is took me off the court. They tried to make me walk, could not walk. My knee blew up. And then they just stuck me in the assistant coach's car and dropped me at my aunt's house. And then we had to pick up, somebody had to come get me to drop me home. And that was that was the management of it. There was no athlete trainer, there was no physio, anything present, and this was national team practice. Oh, so wow. at 15 years old, I knew that this was not right and I did not want that to be the case for my friends or for anybody else to have to go through that. And that's kind of what drove me to do stuff in sports medicine. I mean, at 15, I didn't really have a clear cut idea of what it was going to be, but this is kind of what I envisioned to a sense. Um, so yeah, that's why I became an athletic trainer because of, I, of wanting to really serve my country and also my friends and also just, I like sports and sports medicine. It's interesting. There's always some kind of new development happening and always things to learn and you don't get to sit behind a desk all day, so. But yeah, definitely a benefit. <laughs> yeah, so I just kind of gave you like <laughs> a lot of stuff in there. Did I miss a question? I feel like no, that's good. I was just kind of like you know getting an idea of where you've come from, and I threw a bunch of questions out there as just a general knowledge base where where I could kind of get an idea. Yeah. yeah. So cool. Um, so right now, uh, what setting you're currently working with? Okay, so. I, I do a lot of things, <laughs> as um, you will probably find if you interview athletic trainers who don't work in countries where athletic training has been established. Um, we will do a lot of things, as in, so here in Trinidad, because most of the time there are no rules, <laughs> which kind of works to your benefit and also to your annoyance and detriment sometimes because then you'll have people who are not certified um calling themselves athletic trainers because they've discovered the term athletic trainers uh athletic trainer sorry and then you'll also have people calling themselves physio and again they did not go to school to become a physio or anything like that it's just physio is very much a colloquial term in the commonwealth region physio is what's used to refer to anybody who is that person that will run on the pitch to see if you're okay and that kind of stuff. That's just what we call physio. So even if that's been the case, like when I started working with the national rugby team here, I told them I'm athlete trainer, blah, 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 blah. They would try it. They started calling me that for like two weeks. And then after that, it just went back into physio because it's so ingrained 
culturally, <laughs> right? It's, it's just, it's just what it is. But I think it's one of those things that for me, once I've told them from the beginning, this is what I am, this is what I do, blah, 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 blah. I'm more okay with them calling me physio because I understand the cultural aspect of it. It's one of those things that is not going to change overnight, but it will change the more that I say, okay, I'm this, but so it starts sticking in their head. So they know, it's not that they don't know, and they've they've also defended me to other people as well, say like, well, she's an athlete trainer and blah, 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 but they'll still call me physio anyway. So <laughs> once you kind of start, <laughs> like just these small little steps, but you kind of have to understand the cultural nuances of things as well too. Um, so I have, I work in a university currently. I also work at Falls Clinic, uh, so I do my own private practice. I also do home visits for patients and athletes as well. I also work with a club rugby team, um, and then I also have worked with the national senior men's rugby team, rugby sevens team, the national senior and junior women's hockey team, national volleyball team. I also work with the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee, and yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah, a lot. That's yeah. So it's a lot in terms of like, because it's a small island and it's a small pool, you kind of get a lot of opportunities that a lot of, if I stayed in the US, I would not have gotten to do. So because the pool is so small, but at the same time, the flip side, because the pool is so small, you get stifled and you get put into a box and you kind of, um, it, it, it kind of stifles your growth. And because again, international, like true international 80s are kind of forgotten because we don't get paid in US, we get paid in whatever currency, or at least I don't, like because of where I live. I don't know if that's different for Americans working in other countries. Um, but most of the times, if you're international, true international 80 and working in a country, you're getting paid in whatever country you're working in. So the exchange rate for TT to US is now probably close to seven Trinidadian dollars to one US, which makes it very challenging when I have to do courses and stuff to maintain my CEUs. I'm glad that it's only 50 now, but still that's 50 contact, that's 50 hours plus I have to do, including the 10 evidence-based ones, which are usually hard to find and cost a lot of money for me. And it becomes very challenging to now maintain your certification um, and the standards of practice when you sometimes literally cannot afford to do so in the two years. And going to convention is one of the easiest way to do it, but at the same time, that's still really costly for somebody who lives and works in a currency that is not the US and that the currency balance is always fluctuating, going up and down, depending on what's going on and that kind of thing. So sometimes I think um, we kind of got, we get forgotten and the fact that it's good that we get held to the same standards as everybody else, but it's also at the same time, like, you no know, kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? No kind of leeway or anything is given for the fact that, you know, we recognize you live in a different country. Sometimes it's really hard to get continuing ed courses and doing stuff online is good, but you don't, You sometimes you would need that classroom experience you need that contact but especially if he's not a you know a person who does well with doing stuff online like i get bored i can't do 50 hours of work online i i would cry if i had to and I totally agree <laughs> and then the thing that happens is that because if you live in a place where it's not regulated it's not checked you don't really have any incentive to maintain your certification especially if you're content with where you live so i know some people who after it lapsed because they just couldn't get the 50 and they're just like, eh, it is what it is. <laughs> There's no drive to really and truly maintain that true status of being a certified athletic trainer because there's nobody to check it and there's nobody to really answer to. And if they suspend you, be like, okay, cool, suspend me. Okay, cool, take away my certification. But nobody here is actually going to check. So I can still call myself an AT. The rest of the ATs will be pissed and we'll tell you not to do it, but at the same time, like there's nobody to actually say, okay, well, you can actually go to jail for doing this kind of thing. So yeah. yeah. I was wondering when you were when you were talking about that, like, is there anything that exists that is kind of like a area that you were able to, you know, get help from as an international athletic trainer in terms of like the World Athletic Training Association, uh, the World Federation of Athletic Trainers, or um like the nata in terms of like support is there anything that exists um so the so wafat is 
um, really awesome and it's it's good in the sense of it exists and it, it's bridging that gap between athletic training and therapy and physio and it's a nice like nice little bundle of things um so that's great but in terms of what do you mean support as in like in what sense is there a way for them to help you transition if you go from one country to another within the system or if um like when you were coming back to trinidad and tobago from the u.s yeah. were you able to find like information on how practicing would be different or was it kind of just, okay, I'm leaving the US, bye, I'm gonna have to figure <laughs> Pretty, it was very much the latter. It was very much like, all right, August 15 will around, cool. So I need to be out of this country like today. So later, <laughs> I'll let y'all know when I got there. Um, so yeah, it was very much like you leave and you go home and kind of just, you know, see what happens. I mean, I had the benefit of having, um, some 80s here already there is less than 10 of us i'm pretty sure there's only like seven or eight actual athletic trainers in the country of Trinidad and tobago um so i had the benefit of, of knowing that there were people who existed and that they were here so i was able to get into contact with with them um and because it's an island and everybody knows everybody and it's super small it was not hard to do um and then for me my problem is i came back with my own formulation of what this was going to be and i was kind of fairly accurate because i was a national athlete so i knew the system and i knew what was lacking and what was going to be lacking and what was not good so i i had that benefit of you know i've already in, been into that sports med system and i wasn't coming back in blind um and that kind of thing so no there was no international support um there's not from Wafat. I mean, again, because we're small, like I've, I've brought up that too. I've kind of, I've brought that up at a meeting before. I'm like, but again, it's because we're small, we're one country. Um, I don't think that there are other, I don't know if there are other athlete trainers on the uh, English speaking Caribbean of these smaller islands. Um, but if there are, their struggle is probably going to be a little bit worse or not worse, but different. Um, than mine just because Trinidad is very developed in terms of along the Caribbean or probably one of the most developed countries. Um, so a lot of people, a lot of these small islands will come here. It's kind of like an EU kind of thing. We have like free travel throughout the Caribbean and people could come work. Here. And a lot of nationals from smaller islands will come here to work. So even if they're 80, they're more than likely will come to Trinidad to work at some point in time before they go back to their own country, just because the, the sporting systems and sporting bodies differ in regards to the nata i mean again there is a i i genuinely think that we are a forgotten tribe <laughs> as in yes there's the international committee and that kind of thing but to say that it actually truly understands what it is one to be an international um going to school and and working in the us I don't, I don't really think so. Um, but then also to be an international train in the US and then have to go back to your country where you came from to now try and take something that was developed for America and America's healthcare system and America's sporting system and sporting culture to bring it back to your culture and to your healthcare system to teach you how to adapt that. That is definitely not something you learn in school. Um, it is something that you, you you have to kind of figure out on your own and it's it's very daunting and very frustrating and you run into a lot of obstacles and battles that you know are asinine that this should not happen but you have to figure out a way to deal with it or just be like well i'm good i'm not going to be athlete training anymore athlete trainer anymore and i know that that thought has crossed my mind um, I knew that if I stay in Trinidad for a long period of time, I'm probably not going to be an athlete trainer for the rest of my life. That is easily not going to be a thing. And it's not because I don't love my profession, but it's one of those things where I my I get island fever or cabin fever all the time because I travel so much. And athlete training does not really offer that much opportunities here. Um, there has to be another way to kind of develop and grow yourself. Um, so yeah, <laughs> it's it's a it's a very interesting kind of niche that I think I th think we kind of get forgotten sometimes of you know our experience as an international student combined with athletic training is very different from seeing if you're American going to work internationally because um, even if I wanted to go work 
um, with like, you know, they have the experiences in China to go work in China as well too. The paperwork and visa stuff that American has to do is different than what I have to do because my passport is not American. So there's the whole visa requirements and that kind of stuff that also have to be taken consideration depending if you want to go work somewhere, right? So it's a lot, but I've been lucky in the sense I've gotten to travel and I've gotten to work with, like I just came back from Ibiza where I worked with a team from Australia and you're like yeah come to Australia and I have to be like ah, I really want to come but athletic training isn't really recognized there so <laughs> uh, <laughs> so yeah so I've gotten to do a lot of cool things and practice internationally and and that's really really awesome because I'm, I'm in a small country so um but yeah the the challenges are a little bit different um I'm trying to figure out how to adapt this thing that it's that is not meant for my healthcare system that is very much Commonwealth NHS based um, to to hear it's it's a it's challenging and it's it's it can be hard and frustrating at times. So yeah, I I actually had the thought um, uh, to work in South America uh, with a with a football team with a soccer team back when I started my my schooling. And then I found out, well, athletic training isn't recognized in basically all of the countries in South America. And they have all um, like physical therapy that does it. And if I went there and tried to work as an athletic trainer, then I would be committing fraud and could get arrested for not being a physical therapist and practicing physical therapy. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's because no. literally the rest of the world, like it calls, we call it physio, like it's just physiotherapy. And it's, it's, it's one of those things So Jamaica, so the University of West Indies is the main university for the Caribbean, right? So there are campuses in different islands and the main and campus in Jamaica, they have, that's where the physiotherapy school is. Um, and they have this thing called athletic training and I've saw it and I'm like, oh, that makes me so mad because it isn't what you're calling it athletic training. <laughs> I was like, oh, it's so annoying, right? But I've met physios that have come out today and they're all really snobbish towards athletic training because of that program that they have there. So when they meet me and I'll be like, nah, I can diagnose, I can pick out a concussion better than you can. I could identify one and deal with it pit side better than you can. They're like, no, I no, I can. I'm like, well, give me fact that you just graduated from school. Pretty sure I can do it better than you. But they're really snobbish from the get go. Like you just graduated from school. I've been doing this for since like 2012, buddy. Like calm down. But they're snobbish from school because of the program that they have. They have this version of athletic training that's been like peddled across the Caribbean or from Jamaica. So when they come to Trinidad and they meet like the actual athletic trainers, they're like, ah, oh, okay, cool. So you guys kind of could do some of the stuff we can do. Like, yeah, yeah, we can. It's like, ah, oh, so you guys are really good at pit side stuff. Yeah, yeah, we are because we're trained to do that. It's like, oh, but you won't deal with car accidents and stroke. I'm like, nah, buddy, all you, yeah, you take all you will not cross that line. Don't even worry about it. Not not going to happen. So when you actually now start to educate them and be like, yeah, no worries. We totally know what our scope of practice is. We've built drill, drilled in it. Not going to cross that line. This is yours. There are things that overlap that we could work together on, which is fine. It's generally how society is supposed to work anyway. So yeah, we'll work on the things that overlap and then we have our distinct differences and that helps the conversation along. But at the same time, the same issue that you have with the phys not being a physio when you go to South America is definitely the issue that we have here. But because we're so small and open, conversation and we know physios and that kind of stuff will explain it be like oh okay yeah you're fine so what will help us is if we create or when we create an association for Trinidad like Trans Tobago Athletic Trainers Association um, when we create that that'll help kind of give a certain amount of credibility to the profession and to people practicing here um, but the these it's such a glacial pace for change and stuff to happen here that it, it takes forever for things to be accomplished and um, a lot of the times people would get will get disillusioned with practicing athletic training because there's so much limitations on the things that you can and can't do and that the knowledge that you come out of school with isn't enough to sustain you for a long period of time because then you'll get you'll you'll one either you'll start to feel very complacent 
in the practice um, that you have, which was me when I came out of school and came, and even after my year of internship, I came home, I was like, all right, cool, need to learn something new, like yesterday, like, <laughs> why am I still doing the same things I just learned in school, like it must be something else. And there isn't really that much opportunity too, so you just have to become your own teacher, like you have to find things online, find courses, do stuff online, and um, do that drive to fix it on your own, but, um, that fraud thing is very much very real which is one of the reasons that we can't go to australia because australia physio board don't play so what um what are some of the main differences between like physio physical therapist and athletic trainer in the sense of uh you know it since you have practiced in the u.s um I think the one of the main differences it's just, it's similar in it's similar in the sense of the U.S. Like the main differences I like I like to describe it as like PTs in the U.S. Especially when they come out of school are very clinical based, um, and I've had my some of my friends here who have been trained in the U.S. as PT, and then people find out that they're physio and get them to try and cover like a rugby game and then lose their minds because they're like I can't do this like what the hell is this like what are you supposed to do where's like, my table where's yes, my <laughs> yeah, exactly it's very and they've said this like nah like i can't i can't do this like this is not <laughs> this is not what i was trained for i'm like exactly this was not what you're trained for which is why like with you guys you have to go like with pt sorry like they'll have to go and do like ses and that kind of stuff so with physio it's the same same process you'll go to school and become a physiotherapist, but they'll get exposed to like a little bit more aspects of sport physio as well. So they'll learn how to strap properly in school um, and they'll learn different, like how to like basic first aid and first responder stuff. Um, just because in physio is kind of inherent that you'd be able to cover sports and stuff as well. And again, that varies per country and varies per physio program and that kind of thing, right? But then you also can do a master's of sport physio, right? Which, again, now makes you targeted towards sport, right? So that's also an option that's typically what people, most people will go through as well, go after to go do that master's of sport physio. So now you're a sport physio. Um, so that, when they do that, then they kind of become trained in that athletic training aspect of things. Um, but for us here, the difference is physios can do like we have direct access to everything here. So patients have direct access to us. Like, so I don't, and again, because we're not like, you know, regulated, we try to still function, like follow uh, different rules, like general rules in the NATA. So still have a doctor attached to you. But most doctors are okay if they come see you first and then you determine, okay, do they need to actually go see the doctor or they can start physio right away. So we have direct access for both ATs and PTs here. Um, so we don't need, so that's kind of a genuine perk, um, but like dry needling, which I know is like now a big deal in the US, um, which I mean, that's been practiced since kingdom yeah, come right. everywhere else. Mm -hmm. But for us, like I can easily go do dry needling. I come back and practice here, which is fine. It's kind of expected that I should know how to do dry needling because a lot of my athletes be like, why don't you know how to needle? It's like, thanks for making me feel bad. Yeah, I know I need to do it, but Again, it's expensive, but in US, because it's so regulated and it's one of those like new, not Western medicine practices. So it's like, uh, do we allow it, do we not? And that kind of thing. Whereas here I was like, oh, sure, yeah, try it. Why not? If it works, it works. <laughs> so we have a lot of freeway, but I think the main difference would be just clinical. They're very much more clinical than we are. So it's the same standard difference in the US and here. It's just, you know, the name. <laughs> Can you talk more about um, like accessibility of healthcare um, in Trinidad and Tobago and like the type of patients that you see and how accessible you are to your patients versus um, let's say if you worked in a clinic in the US? Okay, so I've never worked in a clinic in the US, but I've had friends work in like a PT clinic in the US. So I've heard, I've heard stories. Um, so I'll just kind of use their experience to kind of go off of that. <laughs> yeah, so for us here, um, so I've worked in a clinic owned by an athletic trainer, um, which there was two ATs and a PT and then somebody called a sports therapist, so they were trained in the US, in the UK, sorry, um, 
So sports therapy is kind of like athletic training, but not as in depth and long and you know as rigorous as athletic training, right? So sports therapy is like maybe like two years, if that much. Um, so yeah, so it was all of us there. So we've and we had a doctor that would come in every Wednesday and see patients there um, as well. So it's easy for people to get to see physios and to see doctors. Well, not doctors. Easier for people to get physios and ATs um, for rehab or assessments, or evaluations, and that kind of thing. But it's typically people who could afford it. So then when you have uh, which unfortunately, when you have athletes, sometimes athletes can't afford to see physio and doctors and that kind of stuff. So it's still very much they'll get injured and then do nothing about it because our culture is very much of a reactive one and not proactive. So we don't, it's, it's very wrong. much, like exactly, so. exactly, right? And then even when it's broken, if I can still walk and run at it, it don't really need fixing. Is when I literally can't do nothing with it anymore, then I'll go fix it. It's generally how we access that healthcare care. And that's not just sports healthcare or sports medicine. That just sports medicine just reflects the larger picture of our public healthcare or just healthcare and the whole in Trinidad. Like we are very much a reactive people and not proactive in that sense at all. Um, so it's easy for them to access it. It's just that if you can't afford it, then it becomes an issue. So when I have to tell athletes, so I'll get like a lot of school kids. So my population is still very much like uh, my youngest one right now is 10 or 11 at the high performance clinic where we work at because we will do, they will start like strength and conditioning and that kind of stuff at um, 10 or 11. But uh, and so I'll, I have athletes from that age all the way up to 60, 61, 62. So I still get that active population, elite athletes kind of mixed in there. Um, people going to the Olympics, like I had one of my athletes who's going to the Olympics right now. So there's like that mix of people That's through so there. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so like you'll get that mix of people in there. So from 10 to 60 something with elite, non-elite, just trying to get back to where they want to be post up and things. So you get the full hodgepodge of everybody, but it's the people who could afford it. Um, we will do stuff pro bono, like we'll do it like, okay, well, we see potential in this kid, like they're trying to make a national team, blah, blah, blah. So my clinic, my high performance clinic, like we, we have, we don't mind, we'll be like, all right, just pay for one and you get two free. And I think just because we are driven by wanting to make a change in the mindset of the youth, because we recognize if we educate the youth on the importance of taking care of yourself and doing proper physio when you're injured and doing strength and conditioning and that kind of stuff. Once we introduce that kind of healthcare and that holistic approach to things from young, that when they get older and they start to get to the national teams, they themselves will demand it from their coaches and their technical staff, which will make it harder for the technical staff and the, the organization bodies to dismiss it as, we don't need to take care of that now, we need to take care of everything else first. But they'll, the athletes themselves will demand no, we need a proper physio, not somebody who's calling themselves a physio, but somebody who actually knows what they're doing. And we need a strength coach and all that kind of stuff. They themselves will demand it. And it's it's starting to happen, which makes us happy and tickle on the inside and makes the organizations hate us. We're like, no, that's okay. We don't mind. They, they know what they need and that kind of thing. So there's that. But then you'll also get the patients who are still like the older ones who are like, eh, I, my doctor says I have to do this, so I guess I'll just do it like once a week and then be non-compliant, which is interesting because my older patients tend to be non-compliant compared to my younger ones. So, <laughs> which that's I get. Familiar. That's familiar in the U.S. as well because in, in clinics you get um, the individuals, if you work in a clinic, you normally work with a, a physical therapist or a physician, and a lot of the time, those people are trying to, and not really, not all of them, but they're trying to play the system and get. Like workers' comp. Yeah, exactly. They try yeah, to stay yeah. out as long as they can, and yeah. they won't do their stuff just because they don't want to get better, and it happens yeah, a lot. Yeah. 
yeah so, so we and then like so workers comp as, uh, as well so like physios and stuff will do workers comp um but we we can't or we won't obviously here um but then insurance now becomes tricky as well because insurance will cover so it's yeah, a hit or awesome. miss like sometimes they will sometimes they won't it helps especially if you know somebody in your insurance company and it'd be like yeah she's still she's actually doing my physio blah 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 and then they'll approve it again the clicks of living on a tiny island everybody knows everybody um but then there's sometimes where they won't approve it and then you just have to suck it up and pay your own money so that's also a deterrent as well when you when they ask you if insurance cover it you're like well 50 50 more like 60 40 actually it's like 60 40 that they're going to cover it um and they'll, they'll go to physio or go to somewhere else kind of thing. So, but if, you, if you've made a name for yourself um, and you have athlete or people referred to you, not from doctors, but from their friends, that makes it easier for people to actually stay and do physio and stuff with you because they've been referred, that personal referral is a, holds more weight than a doctor's referral most of the time. So, so with that, with insurance and accessibility, is there a huge like cultural or financial barrier to be able to see people who need to be seen or like people who are probably not getting the care that they need? Is athletic training or like physio, the clinic you work in, available for those people if they can't see a regular physician? Like is it like the first stop along the way and it's kind of like something that they can get if they can't go anywhere else? Um, uh, yes and no. Um, because my clinic, we were kind of situated in the Northwestern side, which is technically where all the rich people live, or most of where we perceive most of the rich people to live. Um, uh, it, it, we this, The athletes that we get there, if anybody gets injured or any of the athletes gets injured there, typically what happens is that they'll tell me first and that I will see them then and there. Cause we have like groups. So we have like a tennis group that comes and does their strength training. And then you have individual kids. And most of the times if I'm just like walking around between patients or like, I'm just like floating inside, they'll be like, oh, Kemba, can you check this kid's wrist and blah, blah, blah. So like, that's usually typically how it happens. It's a very symbiotic, um, approach so i'm very much just intertwined and the kids will know my name or my face even though they've never had to come see me but i they know me and i know them so it makes it easier for like oh yeah my wrist is hurting me blah 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 and i'll check them right then and there for no charge or no cost or anything like that and if it's something that i think they need to go on to see a doctor i'll tell them or i'll tell the i'll tell the strength coach who will tell the parent um or I will say, well, okay, you need to come see me and do rehab, blah, blah, blah. So that works really, really well. But again, if they're already there in that high performance clinic, that means their kid afford it. So, you know, them coming to see me isn't really going to be an option most of the time. Like, it's not going to be an issue. But then what we have um, with what happens with when you have national athletes, like the whole just system, unless you are truly an elite athlete or in the elite athlete program, then you don't get funding. So then you pay for everything out of your pocket, right? And if you live wow. on the <laughs> southern end of the island, which is with my case, so when I was a national athlete, we didn't even have like an elite funding program, but we were competing at an elite level, right? So a lot of these times, like, yeah, I was paying my money and my mom and my dad like paying money for me to go to practice to buy gear doing fundraisers to get clothes to go to that's that still happens to this day so if we don't have money for transport for practice there's no way we're going to have money for physio or strength and conditioning and that kind of stuff so you'll find that now that we have the elite unit that some athletes if they're in that program they could come and they could train there and there's a physio there now so they'll get physio and stuff there um, or sometimes they'll call me in to come and look at an athlete there as well too um, but if they don't have that and they and even then if they live on the other end of the island and then they work at eight to four job that leaves the hours before seven o'clock and then after four o'clock to do your training and or your physio which doesn't give you that much time because then you still have to cater for traveling back to wherever you live if you don't have a car or if you drive. So access to healthcare is very, it's varied and it depends a lot on your socioeconomic status. Um, 
And it's especially if you are an athlete and especially if you're aiming to be a national athlete or you are a national athlete and you compete at a high level, the level of care that you take, that you exhibit towards yourself when it comes to physio and stuff really and truly is entwined with your socioeconomic status and your, your ability to afford things more than your ability to find it. A lot of athletes don't know, especially what you'll find is a distinct difference between the athletes who have gone to university in the US and have been exposed to athletic training, athletic trainers, PTs, strength coaches. You'll know those athletes in a heartbeat. But then you have the younger ones or the ones who did not go anywhere to the US and then have only been experienced with Trinidad. There's a difference between the two. Like this group here knows what they need to do and knows the access to stuff and can pick out, you know what you're doing, you're talking a bunch of crap. They can pick out who is who, right? But the other ones, they don't. And they'll just want to present it. And I'd be like, okay, cool. Yeah, they'll just grab everything and believe everything that this one person's saying. Um, and not being able to decipher who's who and that kind of stuff with this group of people across here. Um, so yeah, I agree with that. We, yeah. we actually had um, one, uh, actually no, we've had three, four. Since I've been uh, working at Indiana State with track and field, we've had three to four athletes from Barbados and mm -hmm. uh, they would come and, and they kind of were suspicious about what we were doing. And if they got hurt, they're like, oh, go see them. And they're like, mm, I don't know. But now that they've been with us for a little while, they're kind of like, oh, OK, I get this. And then uh, one of them went back to get healthcare, And he was like, I don't know why I did that. <laughs> you know, like yeah, he was yeah, yeah. he was getting something for his hamstring. And we had him set up for, like, I, I think dry needling, something like that. And he said, no, 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 I'm just going to go home. And so he went back and he got some sort of treatment and then he got set back from whatever happened. He's like, I wish I didn't do that. You know? Yeah. So. Yeah. It's, it's, it's one of those, like when they come home, they know the difference. Um, and that in itself kind of makes them sad or makes them mad. Um, the fact that they don't have access to those things as easily as they should. Or like, for example, I will tell people, I'm like, it's insane to me that I worked at a high school and I had a budget and supplies and all that kind of stuff. And then I work at a university here and I don't can't even get tape. Like I can't get tape. I can't get a stupid ultrasound machine. Like I can't get anything. I was like, that is insanity to me. Like it does not make any sense. And it's the same thing like I work with a national team. Like I've worked with national teams and traveled and be like, I have no supplies. I have to buy my own stuff because they just don't see the priority in sports medicine at all or yet i should say or strength and conditioning so it's it's a labor of love at times um that some of us can bear and some of us just can't do it so which is i mean that's okay as well too on on that note well one of my uh well my last question is kind of like if there was one change that you could make in athletic training in your practice in Trinidad and Tobago, what would it be? Or if you can't really make a change, is there a way that you can incite one? <sighs> one change? That's like, buddy, that's like a whole <laughs> A whole book full. Dude, do you even know? Um, <laughs> honestly, <laughs> If I if I can make a change, it wouldn't just be in athletic training because that would be a very myopic view of things. Um, my change would definitely go into the healthcare system just because I recognize that the things that I deal with doesn't stem from only sports medicine. It's very much a reflection of our healthcare system in Trinidad and Tobago. It's just, it is broken and the people powers in charge just don't really see it that way. Um, I would I would change just the entire healthcare system and make it functional and make it more accessible and make it efficient and make it not, just make it with standards and that kind of thing. And you see, once, once we have standards in like actual standards of practice in public healthcare and we don't run out of ibuprofen in a hospital, like once those things stop happening and start actually, and like patient outcomes are actually valued and people want to ensure that their patients, they have a high outcome and they actually, you know, return back to that level of function. 
once that starts happening with the general population, it will trickle down to the smaller branches of, of medicine. So it will happen with sports medicine. It will happen in private practice and clinical practice and that kind of thing. But if it can't happen, if I can't even say, well, okay, go to the hospital and go see one of the doctors there in clinic and be like, okay, you will get seen this week and not next year. Or, okay, go do physio at the hospital and your wait time isn't a year and a half. To, and this is not, I'm not making this up. This is actual, actually what happens. There's a year and a half wait for physio or for MRI. Like one of the boys in my rugby club hurt his knee and I suspected ACL and they couldn't afford to go to a private doctor. So they went to the hospital and his, he did this in July and his MRI date, I kid you not, was April of 2017. Oh my God. 2016. Yeah, because that was last year. I kid you not, that's that's real things that happen. So so now that affects my ability to properly like treat you because like I have no clue what's going on and I can't send you to a private doctor who can do a diagnostic ultrasound and you know guide the rehab because that's twelve hundred dollars that you don't have because you're 17 years old, just graduated from secondary school and don't have a job and your parents aren't rich. And twelve hundred dollars is a lot of money to spend on one visit. So, <laughs> so if if the if the public healthcare and the is better, it will affect everything else. So that's the change I would make. I wouldn't just do it for athletic training or sports med on the whole. It it would be a just like healthcare change on the whole. Like that that's what needs to change, not just athletic training. But if I could change for athletic training in the US, I would make it so that athletic training programs include an international aspect in it as in they teach people about international medicine and international sports medicine, um, all the different nuances and also the cultural importance of where you are going to practice. So you can't, if you, especially if like, it's if you wanna go set up and be the first athletic trainer in a place, by all means go ahead. Or if you have no choice, but going to be the first athletic trainer in a place, cool right but you need to at least come out with some kind of experience in school be like okay i know how to set up this i know how to be able to appreciate okay culturally these people use a lot of natural medicines and that kind of stuff i wasn't trained with that but let's figure out a way to make that work and appreciate that cultural difference and cultural nuance and apply it to athletic training not kind of not be which i've found happens and be like i didn't learn it that way so therefore it can't be right. Like, I'm not gonna do that. Like that doesn't make sense. That's, there's no evidence to support that. Anecdotal evidence still counts. <laughs> Especially when you're in a small island culture where um, superstitions and bush medicine and stuff is very much still practiced. Like you still, there's things that you have to respect and that kind of thing. So I would make that more of a component of athlete education because it would benefit, I think, everyone. I think, um, and then it'll open, It'll make it easier for other, um, what's the word, other um, boundaries to be broken down and make it easier for people to like, okay, if I want to go practice internationally, then, okay, I have options to go. Where can I go? Where's athletic training recognized and that kind of stuff and make it easier for you to not have to, you know, fight up and that kind of stuff. So like Ireland, you could go practice in Ireland, just take the exam and you'd be certified in Ireland. A lot of kids don't know that, but that should be something that should be taught because they're like, all right, cool. So you don't have, you're not confined to the borders of the United States. You can do a lot more. So that's it. That's what I would do. Unless it's fraud. Unless it's fraud. Unless it's fraud, then you kind of have to stay your happy backside in the US and just chill out there. <laughs> oh, go, go do a master's of sport physio and then you can practice anywhere in the world. Yay. <laughs> yeah. Or just come to Trinidad because we have no rules and we'll just take everybody, so you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> or that. Yeah, I think that that's like a blessing and a curse, like you said. You know, it's kind of like, yay, there's no rules, but then yeah. also, oh no, there's no rules. No rules that yes. Means that, like, yeah. I don't Literally. <laughs> I've gotten people that have come from seeing physios and and they'll tell me the stuff that they do. And it's it's so hard because I can't control my facial expressions very well. So I can't, I can't, it's really hard for me to like, be thinking, the hell did he do and not have my face say 
the hell did he do? Like, it's really hard for me to do that. So it's, it, it happens so often. And then not only that too, like when you go on like multi-sport tours, I remember I went with the Pan, the Pan and Games and I went with the uh, national football team. Like I went to the Olympic committee, I was working with the national women's football team. And we got somebody who is a massage therapist, but also works as like a personal trainer, but then also calls himself a strength coach. But we all, on our team, we all, the national team has the actual strength coach who is also my boss at the high performance clinic. So he's actually, actually like a strength coach. <laughs> Um, so this dude is one to be telling them all kind of stuff and he's just and we're just sitting there like oh my god you're gonna kill somebody's child like and so said so done because he was trying he didn't actually kill somebody but he's trying to teach them how to do a handstand or a head a headstand and was trying to tell them to load their forehead when they're doing the headstand and yoga and i'm like you're going to break somebody's neck so that's that's the point where me and the doctor were like nah nah dude like this was entertaining to a certain point, but when you're trying to like basically do somebody like chin to chest, like we're good. Like this is, <laughs> so those are real things that happen because we have no rules and they tend to be the most vocal about things. And they are the ones who will tend to, they've been in the game longer um, because I could give, so the history of that actually, which is not what you asked for, but the history of that stems from before we had actual like physios and ATs before like that was happening. We had PTIs, which are pers- like from the army, right? So they were trained in first aid and they got their personal training and stuff in the army. And that's what the government and stuff would use for national athletes and strength training and that kind of stuff so because we started off with that that is still intertwined in the sports medicine system so you'll have people coming out from the army as ptis thinking that okay now they could go and work as physio and blah 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 because they've done like basic first aid and that kind of stuff or basic personal training right because they've come out to the army Um, and because we have a system called national duty so when i go because my university is a national university when i go on tour i don't lose money i still get paid because i get leave off for national duty so as long as we still have national duty and it's not an actual paid job (laughs) there's a lot of things that still happen because of you know that influence from the army and protective services and that kind of stuff so that's a island commonwealth history for you right there (laughs) so awesome Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. I've uh, given you a lot <laughs> yeah. of experience, experience to get an idea of what, what you've been doing and, and how it relates to what I'm learning about and um, how we can so, hopefully make a change eventually. So what if they, if I can ask, like what if, what are you guys yeah. learning in school about, I guess like international practice and that kind of thing? Um, right now we're learning a lot about, um, not necessarily international practice, we're going to be taking more, uh, modules on this course throughout another four to seven weeks after this course. Um, so, but in this course, we've been talking about, uh, like underserved populations in the U S and mm-hmm. then how that relates to, um, like accessibility of healthcare, how like cultural barriers and financial barriers, socioeconomic barriers relate to who is able to get uh, treated and why or why not, and how to work with um, maybe different religious factions where um, like maybe their garment you aren't able to touch them, how you treat them. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things in that regard. Um, So I think once we once we get an idea, and I think we're probably going to use these interviews as a as a way to, you know, start that conversation in the course. Uh, mm-hmm. Like, then we'll be learning more about it in terms yeah. of how yeah. interaction happens between, like, an athletic trainer in the U.S. or an athletic trainer who leaves the U.S. So. Yeah, I, I mean, think it's a huge conversation that we. Yeah, it's a. Th- I mean, like, so for us for Trinidad because we're a very diverse population. Like today is Eid al-Fitr, which is celebrates the end of the month of Ramadan, 
So that's a public holiday here. So we celebrate like all religious, major religious holidays as public holidays. So we are very much exposed to all different creeds, crafts, religious backgrounds. So we're very in tune into how to treat people. Like by treat people, I mean like treat them with physio in that sense kind of thing. So I know what can or can't happen if I have a woman who's wearing a hijab or who's, you know, strictly practices Islam and that kind of stuff. Like I know what to do, what not to do and that kind of stuff because it's so ingrained in my culture. Like it's and one of those things. So it's, it's, it makes it easier for that kind of um, access to happen because there isn't any kind of, um, you know, on in uncertainty because we've we've grown up with it. It's it's my culture. It's not really somebody else's culture. It's my it's mine. I've I've grown up with it. So yeah. um but I think like when you guys think of access to care, like when you're dealing with like your steep uh underserved populations just think about it like if it's an international thing as well because a lot of times what happens is you have if you have an area that's predominantly immigrant or migrant or they'll have those little pockets of you know international people that they're bounded by a culture um and then you have to kind of understand the cultural nuances of how you're going to deal with that as well like if they're if they're only used to you know bathing on sundays then you kind of have to figure out a way to deal with that so but yeah that's cool that's fun i hey. currently i'm more with a uh, uh like a professional march sort of drum corps before say that again um, have you heard of like uh, drum corps? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Band? I drama yeah. Corps. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I currently, right now, that's that's where I'm at. I'm doing a tour over the summer with the drum corps um, through the U.S., going from city to city, state to state, and we have a number of international students from Japan and Canada and Europe who like try out for the position and they got it so they're with us. And like one of the interesting things is, you know, not not only like trying to communicate with them because the, the Canadians mainly speak French and uh, obviously the Japanese speak Japanese, but yeah. um, it's like the, the difference between like what I do and what they have done in the past. Like you mm -hmm. said, like how, what kind of treatment you give based on what the culture is like um, and I've kind of gotten a, an eye-opening experience of that in terms of what what is okay to do and what they prefer not to do, you know, that yeah. type of thing. Um, like, like and then, for me, what did he, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I, I was just saying that and then like the concept of uh, insurance and if something happens. So we, we had an individual lose uh, false teeth. And it's kind of like, okay, what do we do with this? You know, like, <laughs> do we wait? Uh, you know, and because you know, like, international dental insurance doesn't really exist. At least Unless you have travel, travel insurance, insurance, like your travel insurance. insurance. You have to have like really good travel insurance. <laughs> really good. Like, like this individual has travel insurance, and it covers like. Uh, catastrophic and medical and bags yeah. and everything, but there's nothing with, like <laughs> dental, yeah, right, <laughs> dental vision, you know, all the little things yeah. are not yeah. included on that. Yeah, like mm -hmm. so for me, when I so I've um, I traveled with two like rugby teams who are like pool players from all over the world. So I went to Vegas and Vancouver earlier this year and we had a bunch of Australians. I knew one of them before, um, but then a bunch of other people came up, a bunch of other Australians come over. And the difference between the Australian athletes and the Americans was so different. It's it's It was insane to me and it was insane to them, the things that the American kids would ask me for versus the Australians. So <laughs> the running joke on tour was that a lot of the American kids wanted their blisters covered and the Australians just, that was mind boggling to them. They're like, why do you want your, why do you have to have her cover your blisters? Like do it yourself. <laughs> like even those like small little things, like it's still two English speaking countries, but the sporting cultures themselves are so vastly different like 
footy in Australia, like you very much take care of yourself and you go see a physio ever so often and that kind of stuff and make sure everything's okay and da 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 da. But for ba- for what they consider baby stuff was blisters and getting a plaster put on. It's like, nah, you do that ish yourself. Like you don't go and harass her to do it or rub my hamstrings. Like <laughs> just in those, like it's sometimes it's just like, you know, two English speaking countries, say two very sporting cultures, but the sporting culture itself is is dramatically different so to me that was entertaining but then we also had like a travel insurance issue so i had a girl had a bad concussion have to take her to the hospital in canada and canada healthcare is not free (laughs) concussion is expensive but she had really really good travel like really good insurance and travel insurance so ct scan everything and that kind of stuff and when she went home and they filed everything she got back her money because her travel insurance was so good like yeah she did see she had to do ct scans and x-rays and she got all her money back and i was like yep but in comparison to the other kid who had travel insurance and had to see the doctor as well because he was deathly sick and i thought you know you probably have ebola and he saw the doctor he got back half of his money and he was pissed because his insurance had said yeah you'll get back everything but then the travel insurance wasn't actually as good as he thought so (laughs) it's just like when you have to do international stuff it's a lot of Little things that you didn't, again, you didn't really get taught of in school, but I mean, you learn on the go, which is fine. A little things you didn't really like think about, like, okay, how much should my insurance actually cover for myself and these kids? Like, what should I tell them? Like, you need to make sure your insurance covers your fake teeth. Like, that, you should do that. You should make sure that's a thing. <laughs> just, just, <laughs> just, just a smidge. Just make sure anything fake, just make sure you can get it back. <laughs> Is it his front? Oh, I don't oh, suck if it's oh, his front teeth. Oh, poor kid. Yeah, front there you go. Poor kid. Oh, how do you lose? How do you lose that? I don't know. Like, they, you can take a minute now, I guess. I, I, think think there's a, came out. I think there's a story in there. Like, he's really trying to show off with some girl, and then, like, it lost. <laughs> <laughs> he's just gonna make up a really thug story like yeah i got into a fight with a bear and the bear was like give me your fake teeth so I had to with my fake teeth <laughs> so I didn't give them them. yeah because it's a bear and you do what a bear says like yeah that feel as i if that was me that's the story i would go with so <laughs> <laughs> but yeah sorry for that segue enjoy the rest of your day great yeah thank you so much you're welcome bye and, um... <laughs>